Let us pray. Dear God, as we hope to hear and understand your word for us today, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to point out a small correction in the key verse today printed in your program where it says I am the way the truth and the light I think that was uh, one of those spell check things that happened with the computer it's supposed to be I am the way the truth and the life life light is a good Christian word but that's not the one we're looking at today when I first became a follower of Christ this was uh, a verse that I heard uh, quoted a lot. Unfortunately, it was very often in the context of uh, setting Christianity over against and apart from other practices and beliefs. So it was meant to empower us to have uh, a defense or a apologia, an apology for our faith to say how we are different and basically how the others are wrong. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and it is exclusive and everybody else is wrong. That's a bit taken out of context here. If you read the whole passage, what he's really saying is, God wants to have a relationship with you like a father. Implying that all through the ages, this loving Father God has been revealing himself to people through the law and the prophets and the Old Covenant, uh, the ways of the retribution dogma, which must balance things out. Everything must be fair and equal. And Jesus is saying that is not, in fact, the way, the truth, or the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Also in the Gospel of the, the book of John, Jesus uh, is lifted up as the very word of God, the logos, the eternal word, message, manifestation, meaning, relationship, connection with God. That's who Jesus is. It's not the book, it's Jesus who is the word of God. When he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, he is uh, presenting himself as the, the manifestation and the clarity about God's nature, God's love, God's intent for us, and God's uh, provision of a way of life for us, which is rich and meaningful. So he's saying, look at me. Consider my words. Consider my ways. Take them seriously. I am the way. Now, I am the truth, and I am the life. I want to take each of those words and look at them just for a couple of moments. I am the way. The Greek word is hodos. Hodos, and it's a very simple word. It simply means a path, a path. As I visualize a path, I remember many occasions when our family is out in the woods, when we're on a trail, we're hiking by a lake, or we're going up mountains. Sometimes we're going through the woods and you can't see anything but the trail. Sometimes we're up on high and the path creeps along a steep ledge. It became very important for us early on in our family adventures to realize that we need to stay on the path. There are some folks who like to go out in the wilderness and get off the beaten trail. This is called bushwhacking, when you just load up your stuff and you just take off. Hopefully you have a compass or some sense of direction when you do that. It's easy to get lost and confused. I've never particularly wanted to be a bushwhacker. It sounded like a lot of work and I'd just soon stay on the trail so I can get where I'm going and uh, pass other people on the trail and have conversations and be safe and kind of know where we're going. You need to stay on the trail. We all know this. We frequently hear stories of people who are out hiking up Mount Hood or up the gorge or out in the wilderness who get off the trail. And unfortunately, we hear these stories about people who are missing. And even more unfortunately, sometimes we hear the stories about people who have gotten lost and died because they went off the trail. So it's a bit more of a, than just a mild suggestion on Jesus' part to say that he is the path. He is the way. Early Christians were often known as the followers of the way, the followers of the path. Jesus is one who shows us the path to God based on who he is. 
And if we listen to him, if we learn from him, if we take seriously what he teaches us, we will stay on a good and straight road. We will not get lost, we won't get confused, and we won't die. Pretty simple. Stay on the path. Jesus also says that he is the truth. That Greek word is aletheia. It simply means the truth. What it implies is that um, what he says is reliable counsel. We can depend on what he says, that it is both practical and enriching and safe. We can listen to his words, implement his teachings in our lives with a lot of confidence. He's not going to lead us astray. His directions for our lives are trustworthy. He knows what he's talking about when he gives us instructions about how to live our lives. He is, after all, again, back in the context of this book, he is the very word of God. He is the manifestation of God's will and intent and character and uh, desire for us in our lives. In this way, Jesus is the truth in context. He compares himself in the scriptures with other declarations of truth that have led people astray. For instance, he says, you have heard it said, love your friends and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies too. And be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Would you agree with me that that is a very different message than we hear day to day these days? When we are so compelled to set ourselves apart against the other people who are wrong, no matter who they are. It's as though we've lost the ability to function as a society without being in competition or contrast or enmity with somebody else. Jesus has done away with all of that, and we need to do away with it as well. He also said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That is, justice is fairness. You should give as you have gotten. Everything must be equal and balanced. When we calculate that in human terms, we can never get it right. There will always be a winner and a loser, one way or another, and the cycles of retribution go on and on indefinitely. There is never justice in that way. Jesus' way and solution to this imbalance in life is, uh, is forgiveness. It is a life of grace. It is a realization that God provides enough for everyone if we will not hog everything to ourselves and take things away from other people. God's given us all we need. God is generous. God makes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. Uh, here in Oregon, sometimes we think that's a blessing, sometimes we think that's punishment, but it's fair. <laughs> Everybody gets uh, what they need in this way. The truth as a reliable way to live is something that Jesus uh, evidenced in his life and we lift up in our theology and our Christology, and it is good to remember what the Apostle Paul said about the attitude we should have if we would live by God's truth. It is simply like this. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. 
So Jesus literally staked and spent his life on the idea that humility and service uh, is the true and good way to live our lives. Speaking of life, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The Koine Greek word here is interesting. The word is zoe, zoe. It's where we get our word zoo from. Zoe, life. A zoo is a place of diverse and wonderful life. Um, we live in a zoo, according to the Bible. How about that? <laughs> Sometimes I've wondered, now it's confirmed. <laughs> and we are all part of it, of the wonderful diversity of life. I'm reminded of the Apostle Peter's experience recorded in Acts chapter 10. He was trying to get his uh, Jewish exclusive mind around the message that God has opened up uh, the kingdom of God to everyone, regardless of what they have done or thought or believe in the past even to the nations, even to the Gentiles. There's no longer any exclusive us, but it is now all of us. And his experience was that he was called to the home of a, of a Gentile. And he was having a real problem with that because he wanted to serve God. He wanted to be a, continue to be a good and faithful Israelite. And it was not permitted to have fellowship or to eat with, uh, with non-Jewish people. He had a vision on an afternoon. He went up on a roof, got drowsy, fell asleep, and had a vision of a great sheet being lowered down from heaven. Perhaps you remember the story. And you remember what was in that sheet? Every kind of nasty, creepy, crawling critter that you can imagine that, that Jews were not supposed to eat. And the voice from God said, rise, Peter, get up, take whatever you want, and eat it. This is mind-blowing. That he could eat whatever he wanted because God now says there isn't anything or anybody that is unclean just by virtue of who they're not. Did you catch that? You are no longer automatically excluded from the kingdom of God or the ways of life and love or the abundance of life just because of who you aren't. And likewise, you cannot any longer de define yourself by who you are compared to who you're not. That is all gone. In that passage, Peter begins to understand. And he says this as he's now preaching to the Gentiles. God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Pretty simple. Anyone who fears or respects or loves God and does what is right is acceptable to him. It's not based on your skin color or your orientation in life or your nationality, where you're from, where you're going, how young, how old, or any of those things. Enjoying fellowship and love with God is simply a matter of, of attitude and behavior. Do you have respect and awe and love for God? Do you desire to do God's will? What more is needed? What more is needed? This is the way to life, which brings us back to the idea of the path. The Christian life is a path. It is a good path. It is a true path. It is one that leads to life doesn't necessarily exclude other people who are working their way Godward also. And we should not use this phrase to set ourselves over against other people. We can take this story, though, as a reminder of what it is we are about and to take it very seriously. Not only our lives, but the life uh, and well-being of our communities depends on our capacity to really understand the grace of God and what the message of Christ is. Jesus is the way. He teaches grace and humility and service. This is what leads to life. 
not competition, not beating other people, not getting yours at the expense of somebody else, but the path of humility and service. Do you believe this? This is the way of Christ. This is what we must practice and lift up for our own sakes if we want to be happy and blessed people, and also if we want to have our voice heard in the world. The church is the body of Christ. We are the stewards of this message. And I take this passage today as, a, as an encouraging reminder of the wonderful truth of the Christian gospel. It is a way that leads to life and blessing. But only if we stay on the path. Only if we learn to know the words of Christ. And then only if we are able to put them into practice. I really believe it's not, not so much what happens in our heads, whether we're believing the right things or not. I really believe what makes a difference and what, what makes Christianity and life in the church a beautiful and good thing is our attitude, a willingness to trust in this message, a willingness to put our faith in this story, a willingness to believe that it is the best way to live. And, you know, and I've said this before, I think it's so easy to get sidetracked. There's so many voices and so much noise in the world that contradicts what we are about. If nothing else, perhaps those voices help us remember what we are about. How our life shines like a light in the world. How yours does too. When we embrace the truth of Christ, live by Christian values, we become light to the world and salt to the earth. If we forget those things, we might as well be a social club because we will have no message. We'll have nothing of any meaning to give to anybody. Well, I think it's really good and I'm so proud of you for coming to worship today, not because uh, I get to talk to you, but because I see in that your intent to stay focused on what it means to be a Christian person. For whatever reason, you're here. So I'm giving you that reminder and that encouragement today, which comes to us. Um, I've said uh, over the years, my understanding of who Jesus is has evolved and changed uh, quite a bit. But I will say, no matter what I am or become in the future, that Jesus is my guy, his story is my story, and I'm sticking to it, and I hope you will too. Together, we have a tremendous ability to generate love and light and grace. And that's what we do. I'm so glad you're a part of the experience today. Will you pray with me? Thank you for your beautiful scriptures, Lord, that remind us about who you are and, and what we may be as we put our faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray.